Hello, this is Dr. John Romano. I'm recording this lecture on classical Greek thought as part of the course History 1100, World Civilization to 1500. And you can follow along with the class website, which is posted on Blackboard. The reason that uh, we're spending an entire session on intellectual history, the history of thought, is because ancient Greek thinkers are often seen as having laid the entire basis of Western intellectual achievements. Now, this does not mean, of course, that everyone in ancient Greece was involved with these kind of intellectual pursuits. The majority of Greeks were not those who went to school. Um, in many cases, uh, they were more interested, uh, rather than speaking about philosophy, for instance, uh, than doing magic. This is actually an example of one Greek magical papyrus uh, that we recovered, uh, in which people could try to summon a demon to do works for them. It's also true that even though there were radical thinkers in the Greek world, certainly openly, most people did not or did not want to openly deny the gods. We should also not think of every single ancient Greek person as having the same ideas uh, as the one I'm going to talk about uh, right now. With all of that being said, most historians tend to feel there was a revolution in thought in the ancient Greek world, especially in the cities. Most people tend to think that the city-state, the polis, was part of the reason for this intellectual revolution. In this kind of political organization, as we've seen, people had popular assemblies uh, normal people could come and speak their minds. They could listen to politicians. Uh, they could make up their minds based upon what they heard. Very often in these Greek city-states, people served in juries. They had to take evidence and decide if someone was guilty or innocent. The reason this is important is because these habits of mind listening carefully to arguments, deciding uh, which uh, position was correct, really ha having to have rigorous proof before one accepted any proposition. These kinds of habits of minds passed over beyond uh, those just uh, connected with politics or the legal system. It got, it got people used to uh, speaking their mind uh, and uh, they began to do so in many different fields of inquiry, many of which, frankly, will be still familiar to us today. For our purposes in a course of history, perhaps the most important new field that was opened up was that of history. Uh, we have not discussed this previously, but the word we use for this discipline, history, is a Greek word from this period. It's a word that means inquiry, and specifically an inquiry into the past. Now, before this point in the ancient Greek world and in other civilizations we've looked at, people did think about the past. However, the way they thought and wrote about the past was very different. Previously, people had written about long, distant events, ones that no one could remember. They tended not to spend much time thinking about cause and effect. Why did certain things uh, come into being? Most, most part, people tended to write in poetry. Now, in the ancient Greek world, People were writing, first of all, in prose rather than poetry, which is a big change. They also were writing about events that took place close to their own lives. Many of the great ancient Greek historians went and interviewed people who had, for instance, taken part in the Persian War. 
One of the historians that you've read a very short excerpt from his class, Thucydides, who is pictured here, wrote the great funeral oration of Pericles that you've read for a previous class. Uh, and uh, this is, source is extremely important to us because, first of all, Thucydides was present for it. Secondly, it preserves the Athenian ideal of democracy for historians today. Historians in the Greek world uh, began to try to understand near contemporary events. They inquired carefully as to the reasons why certain things happened. Uh, they just didn't list things, uh, one thing after the next. They made for the first time history a uh, scientific discipline. Another of the fields in which ancient Greeks were pioneers are science and mathematics. Ancient Greeks began to fearlessly pursue difficult scientific problems. Now, some of you may have grown up listening uh, to ancient Greek myth, and you'll know that Greeks loved to tell mythology, and some of this mythology actually spoke about how certain things in the world came to be. Uh, to give you one example, uh, one that is pictured here in this image, this, the story of Prometheus. The uh, Greeks who supposedly long in their prehistory had stolen fire from the gods and brought it down to human beings. Very often people speak about just this part of the story, but uh, the myth has a gory end that is depicted here. Uh, after the gods caught Prometheus, uh, he was tied up, and every day a uh, bird sent by the gods would eat his liver. And then at night he would miraculously be regenerated, so it could once again be eaten, and he could once again be tortured. Not all ancient Greeks, though, really were any satisfied any longer with this kind of personal view of science. They began to ask difficult questions, for instance, about what is the nature of matter? What is everything we can see made up of? One school of uh, Greek scientists in this, uh, in this time period was the first one to come up with what we refer to as an atomic theory. They said that all nature was composed of tiny little materials that they referred to as atoms. This point of view would uh, later lose out to a competing school that said instead there are four elements, four basic elements, air, water, earth, and fire, and they were combined in different proportions uh, to make up everything we see. So you see here too, this is one of the first scientific debates that existed. Ancient Greeks were also innovators in the field of mathematics, in arithmetic, and geometry. One of the first great Greek mathematicians uh, is pictured in a much later image here, and his name is Euclid. In Euclid's main work, known as The Elements, he wrote what is possibly uh, the most successful textbook in history. Uh, and uh, this is meant, I uh, mean this with sincere praise. The reason uh, that Euclid is important was that he wrote in a very clear, simple style. And uh, again, his mathematical ideas uh, stood the test of time. Here's one, for instance, papyrus uh, that shows his work in geometry. Even more important, perhaps, than his individual results was the method that Euclid used. Euclid set out what he referred to as axioms, propositions that he considered so basic that everyone had to accept them. Uh, just by hearing them, he felt that you would have to accept them. Then, you can take the individual axioms and use rational argument 
to deduce what he referred to as theorems. Uh, so the basic building block is an axiom. Uh, the more complicated uh, arguments based upon them are theorems. The elements would go on to become the foundation uh, for all subsequent mathematics. Uh, another great ancient uh, mathematician was the man pictured here on the left, known as Archimedes. Uh, supposedly, Archimedes would get so caught up in his work uh, that at this point he did not he did not even want to leave when an invading army was forcing him to. Uh, Archimedes uh, really read very closely uh, Euclid's work, and he actually expanded upon it as well. We know that Archimedes was the first person to figure out the difficult question of how do you measure the area of a circle? How also do you measure the volume of a sphere? Uh, these were questions that previously people did not have answers for. To be able to do this, Archimedes was the first person to calculate accurately the size of pi, uh, pi. And the reason why, of course, we use a Greek letter uh, for this concept is that it was a Greek who discovered it. One of the great problems of Archimedes' work is that it was so complicated for people in both his time and the time immediately following that, in fact, many people could not understand his work, and it was often not copied in later centuries, uh, simply because there's no reason to copy something that you could not understand. This meant that, in many cases, we lost some of Archimedes' most complicated work. There is hope, though, for recovering at least some of his great ideas. In this image, uh, what it is showing you is uh, the process of recovery of one of Archimedes' great works. This manuscript had originally contained an entire work of Archimedes. At some point in the Middle Ages, probably a monk decided uh, that it was no longer a valuable text. He scratched it out, and he wrote a copy of the Psalms on top of it. In recent times, we've used infrared technology to read the writing that has been scratched out previously. And in fact, we discovered upon reading this uh, that what we had now uh, was a lost work of Archimedes. It was perhaps more in a similar way like this uh, out there to, for us to find. Some Greek, uh, Greek mathematicians use mathematical principles to attempt to figure out patterns in astronomy. What this meant is that Greek astronomers tended to keep enormously accurate records of the heavenly bodies. What were the different planets doing? Uh, where was the sun traveling? Some of the discoveries that they came up with were far ahead of the conventional wisdom of the time. So, for instance, one astronomical school suggested for the first time that the Earth went around the Sun and that, in fact, the Sun was the center of the universe. This theory is, of course, very familiar to us today, but it was one that failed to convince mainstream astronomers both in the ancient Greek world uh, and in, in the later period. It simply seemed more rational that the Earth was the center of the universe. Uh, it seemed to explain to people of the time why the stars in the sky remained constant. Instead, ancient Greeks ended up coming up with a very complicated system to explain how the movements of the planets continued uh, and uh, uh, how they worked, how they um, they went around uh, the, uh, the Earth. And this is a, a good uh, example of uh, a time in which people had the correct uh, measurements, they had the correct observations, uh, but their theory was lacking. And so 
it would go on to take people another 1,700 years uh, in, in, uh, before people gave up the idea that the Earth was at the center of the universe. Another Greek actually tried for the first time to try to calculate the circumference of the Earth. And uh, he did it by comparing the shadows that were cast by a large building in Egypt at different points of the day. And uh, by using this very crude system, he was able to come up with a number that was around 150 miles off of the correct figure, uh, which, uh, given with what he was working with, was fairly amazing. Uh, this is one Greek astronomical tool, although we have not completely figured out uh, exactly how this particular tool was used. Ancient Greeks also uh, were pioneers in the field of medicine. One of uh, the greatest reasons uh, for this uh, prominence of Greeks uh, is their real devotion to using observation uh, as a part of medicine looking very carefully at what effect a certain treatment had on a patient. This may appear obvious to us in the modern world, but in many cases in the ancient world, people would dream up treatments in the laboratory, and often they had little interest in figuring how they actually had an effect on patients. The earliest body of Greek texts uh, that we have any specific name attached to uh, in the field of medicine is Hippocrates, who's pictured here in this mosaic on the left. Hippocrates was said to be a doctor who lived on a tiny Greek island. We don't have evidence that he himself wrote any of the texts that later would bear his name, but we do think people in the same school of thought that he had created uh, would continue in his legacy. Some of the wisdom in Hippocrates' texts are things that have become foundational for later, later medicine. For instance, Hippocrates felt that the patient needed to be viewed as a whole. You couldn't just look at someone's illness. You had to look at their entire health. He taught that the best healing should take place naturally. Sometimes it's actually better not to intervene. Hippocrates taught that a simple diet was conducive to good health. He also taught that the first duty of doctors was to the patient and not to himself. In terms of his individual research, Hippocrates, who's also shown in this statue, studied epilepsy for the first time, seriously. Epilepsy had before this point been associated with the gods, and in fact, it was viewed as a curse that was sent by the gods. What Hippocrates taught was that instead, this was a disease that was rooted in the brain. He felt it had definite biological causes. He said that it was possibly inherited, and furthermore, that it might be cured by help of drugs. Hippocrates dismissed the idea that magical cures could be used uh, to get rid of epilepsy. Other doctors working in ancient Greek, Greece would really uh, use, uh, use for the first time uh, kind of techniques that we associate uh, with uh, uh, investigation of the body, including especially um, beginning to work with the human body by cutting uh, dead people open, first animals and then dead people, uh, to get some sense of what was in there and how the system worked as a whole. Uh, while this may appear unremarkable, uh, some of the Greek doctors took this to an extreme. Uh, and there are reports that certainly certain ancient Greek doctors actually took living criminals uh, to cut open to figure out uh, things like, for instance, how exactly uh, did the blood flow throughout the system? And you can understand by cutting a body open, you discover this fairly quickly. Uh, in addition, ancient Greeks began to get some sense of what the nervous system was, uh, although uh, perhaps not a very nuanced sense. <laughs>
the greatest limitation that ancient Greek doctors faced was that they could really only deal with what they saw. Uh, they had no sense, of course, that there were microorganisms or anything of that nature yet. Some Greek thinkers began to turn their sights on deeper questions. Different schools began to spring up to ask, what exactly is the meaning of life? And uh, this is the beginning of the, uh, of the study of philosophy, a term that refers to the love of wisdom. One of the earliest schools we can trace of philosophers were known as the Sophists. The reason that Sophists grew up is that in the polis, in the city-state, if you wanted to take part in politics, if you wanted to learn how to influence people, uh, either to get a law passed, or to go to war, well, you needed to understand how to work with words. Eloquence was extremely important. And the sophists promise that by using their techniques of reasoning and speaking, even an ambitious man of low birth could get involved with politics. They taught how to reason out loud. What exactly are the precise rules by which one carries on an argument? And some sophists even went uh, deeper to try to use these uh, skills uh, to try to unravel some of the mysteries of the universe. Now, there was a limitation to the kinds of uh, investigation that sophists did. Some said that they, in fact, were very superficial in the questions they asked. And uh, their critics said that the reason for this was that they would only uh, philosophize if they were given money, if they were paid. The next important school of philosophy really is based upon two separate men. The first pictured here was Socrates, and the second pictured here is Plato. The reason why uh, historians and other scholars have such trouble distinguishing the two men is that nearly all we know about Socrates comes from the writings of Plato, who wrote after his master, Socrates, had died. Plato presents his, uh, his teacher, Socrates, as a hero who lived only for philosophy. And in fact, he ended up dying for philosophy as well. Unlike the Sophists, Plato would never speak uh, for material gain. He would not accept money. Uh, he was simply interested in the discussion and the knowledge. It can be very difficult for us to entangle exactly what Socrates spoke about but it does seem that he was very interested in the nature of the human soul, and uh, he was uh, really engaged in the search for what is truly good. Uh, eventually, Socrates would end up falling victim to trumped-up charges of corrupting the youth of Athens. And uh, these really uh, came about in part because it was an unsettled time politically uh, after the war uh, the Peloponnesian War that Athens had lost because Socrates felt that he had been uh, condemned by the state and he believed in the state, uh, he chose to accept uh, the penalty of death. Socrates thought would live on uh, and uh, not only through the writings of Plato but also through the school that Plato would create. In some ways, we imagine that Plato continued on the same line of his master, Socrates. But Plato also uh, became interested uh, in trying to figure out what was the real nature of reality. Uh, and um, Plato began to feel that what was really real, the true, the true things, were actually hidden from our eyes, and so that our senses uh, deceived us.
Most importantly, perhaps, Plato felt that the soul existed apart from the body. And uh, it was apart from the body, and it was constantly tempted in, uh, and dragged down by the material world. Yet it was only by means of the soul that a person could see the true realities, the really real, uh, that hid behind everyday life. It was only in this alternative uh, reality, this, in this area where things were truly real, uh, that ideas like the good, truth, beauty, and justice existed. Plato, certainly, although he did not create it, he was the person who popularized more than anyone else the idea of the soul, uh, the soul of divine origin, and, of course, its contrast, the body, that imprisoned the soul. Uh, you can understand, of course, that in this and other ideas, uh, Plato will become enormously influential for Christian thought as well, uh, which also, of course, uh, holds a place of prominence for the soul. In uh, the work that you read a part of for today, the Republic, you can see some of Plato's ideas at work. You can see, first of all, that uh, Plato, like his master Socrates, seemed to believe that one of the ways in which knowledge is produced, that a dialogue can in many ways uh, produce truth, a dialogue between a master and a student. The, the particular part of the Republic uh, that you read uh, is the very famous allegory of the cave, uh, which can get some idea of uh, this world beyond the world that we can see that Plato held. In other parts of uh, this work, The Republic, Plato set out his scheme uh, for uh, the ideal society, the ideal city-state. It was a society that he believed uh, would allow people to fulfill ethical ideals properly. Some people have commented that the city that Plato imagined as the ideal society was one that was enormously well-ordered, and, and more importantly, of course, it was ruled over by philosophers, uh, the greatest of people. Some critics have argued, though, that the Republic was joyless and authoritarian in nature. Uh, for instance, one of the things that he thought that the polis had to have was censorship. Uh, to prevent ideas that were incorrect from getting into the uh, the city state and corrupting it, Plato would also go, go on to found an academy uh, that preserved both his ideas and the ideas of his master Socrates. And uh, someone actually referred this uh, as to the, the first university. Uh, as you can see in this picture, not much of this uh, school remains today. This is the archaeological site uh, where uh, Plato would first meet with his students. By far the most important student that Plato would ever have, and someone who would grow, on to, grow up to be a great intellectual in his own right, as the man pictured here, Aristotle. Although Aristotle would learn at the feet of Plato, in many ways the two men had a very different way of approaching knowledge. It seems that Aristotle had little sympathy with, the, with uh, Plato's ideas that there was a world beyond the world that we could see. Instead, what Aristotle wanted to do, his intellectual project, was to collect data and to classify it properly. What he wanted to do more than anything else was sum up what is the information that we have in the ancient Greek world. The reason for this is simple. Aristotle believed that before one could make any generalizations or come to any firm conclusions, it was necessary to have as much data as possible. So, for instance, when Aristotle wanted to speak about government in the ancient Greek world, he had his students go out 
and find copies of constitutions of all the ancient Greek city-states that they could. And only then did he proceed to speak at length or make conclusions about what ancient Greek government was all about. Now, we no longer have this list of constitutions, uh, but it does show us uh, this sort of commitment he had uh, to collecting knowledge. Much more than Plato, Aristotle trusted in sense data. He really wanted to, uh, to find out uh, what one could observe, what one could experience uh, in the world. And uh, there seemed to be no limit uh, to the different fields of inquiry he had. Uh, any knowledge could be summed up, uh, could be examined. Now, when Aristotle was collecting all of this information, he ran into a problem, which is not so much how do you get knowledge, but how do you present it to make sense to your audience? The response to this was the creation of an essay. And uh, this was both a simple and an elegant system to present knowledge to the reader that did not exist before Aristotle. If you have ever written an essay that has an introduction, it has a body that in which you present your evidence, has a conclusion, you are drawing upon a system that Aristotle created to present knowledge in the ancient Greek world. And uh, the influence of Aristotle in this field is so pervasive that, in fact, we don't even recognize that it actually came from someone. Uh, but we have him to thank uh, for the form of the essay. Aristotle, like Plato, did have some interest in political philosophy and uh, thought about how to reform the state. For Aristotle, the basic goal of politics was happiness. And uh, since he was a philosopher, what happiness was for him, that everyone would be able to exercise his or her reason to the fullest extent in the pursuit of moral excellence. The essential part of this process for Aristotle was the idea known as the mean, the idea that happiness, uh, that excellence, in fact, could only be found in a balance between extremes. Uh, so, for instance, um, not having a huge amount of alcohol uh, so as to be hung over, but not abstaining from it completely. Uh, taking a moderate amount of alcohol would be the mean between the two extremes. Just to give you one indication of the enormous uh, amount of influence that Aristotle would have on later generations, uh, this is a manuscript page uh, from Aristotle in the Muslim world. And uh, you can see that's actually uh, a Muslim version of Aristotle deep in contemplation. The wonderful part about the Greek philosophical world, though, was that no one forced you to uh, listen to uh, any of the thinkers we've discussed up until this point. And uh, even at a late date in the Greek world, people were founding their own schools with very different answers of what the meaning of life was, and perhaps more importantly, how to lead one's life in correspondence with that knowledge. Here I'm only going to discuss three of the important late schools of Greek thought, but there were lots of other philosophical schools circulating at the same time. The first of these three are known as the Cynics, which uh, in many cases in the Greek world uh, were some of the most controversial philosophers. The cynics, and one ancient cynic is pictured here, said that the only purpose in life was to attempt to cultivate virtue. One could only discover true virtue if you lived a life in correspondence with nature. Now, this sounds perhaps to you like a fairly simple kind of teaching. 
but what it entailed for your average person uh, was something that most people were not prepared uh, to do uh, uh, to do the cynics argued that you had to withdraw from the world entirely and live an extremely harsh existence if you wanted to do what was authentically human what humans did in nature and so what this meant was that your the cynic philosophers would lead a life in which they barely owned anything they were smelly often they had they really just would wander around from greek city to greek city telling people that their lives were completely out of whack with nature in some cases the cynics would turn social convention upside down uh, again in a really an attempt to challenge what people assumed was the correct way of life to uh, challenge traditional morality so for instance the uh, cynics would go to the bathroom in public now you may think that this is disgusting and in fact most ancient Greeks probably would agree with you but the cynics wanted to do these things to force you to reconsider your way of life now th they would argue that they were living a life uh, in correspondence with nature the way humans really lived and the only reason you did not see that was that you were already so far removed from nature this is a statue of the founder of uh, the school of the cynics known as diogenes now you, you shouldn't think that he actually owned a dog uh, in fact uh, the greek term cynic uh, is closely related to the word for dog and in fact the whole school the school of the cynics uh, initially we think this comes from an insult that greeks would refer to them as a bunch of dogs but gradually they grew to like the name uh, and uh, that is why they adopted it there are many wonderful stories about Di uh, diogenes uh, and uh, his philosophizing in public uh, one of my personal favorites is that once diogenes who remember had said in his school that you were supposed to renounce all material possessions he decided that the only thing that he would hold on to was a very simple cup one day while he was walking he saw a little boy take his two hands together and cup them and take water in his hands and drink it out of his hands it was at this point that diogenes recognized that he had been bested that in fact he hadn't done as he said and lived as close to nature as possible his solution well he got rid of the cup immediately uh, and uh, followed the example of the little boy he saw another of these late schools of greek philosophical thought were known as the epicureans many greeks either feared or hated the epicureans they said that they were a bunch of atheists they believed in no gods the epicureans themselves though were not real uh, were not real atheists they didn't deny that the gods might exist but in any case they said that the gods did not have much influence in human life and in that they set themselves apart from many other greeks what the epicureans taught instead is that the world around us was composed of atoms and when you died uh, it was a glass shattering on the floor the atoms that had once composed your body would fly off in every single direction and there they could go and begin to form into different things the epicureans on the whole did not have much faith in things that they could not see themselves they could not observe they could not touch they could not experience uh, they they really wanted to see everything for themselves
the only purpose in life so far as the Epicureans were concerned was that they wanted to ensure their own survival in the world through pleasure. This was another sticking point from some other ancient Greeks. When they heard that the, uh, the place of pride that the Epicureans had for pleasure, they said, these people are a bunch of hedonists, a bunch of pleasure seekers. Uh, all they want is self-indulgence. The Epicureans, though, said that this was unfair. Yes, they want pleasure, but the question they said was, what kind of pleasure do we want? They said instead what true pleasures are, are the ability to, for instance, make friends, hold discussions, uh, philosophize, uh, all of these things. In fact, Epicureans taught that their life was already more pleasurable than the vast majority of people because they did not suffer from a fear of death. The Epicureans taught instead that unlike most people who go around their lives not knowing what happens after death, the Epicureans had absolute certainty about what happens after death, uh, what we've already discussed. So they could spend their, their lives uh, just dedicated to reason instead. Sometimes the Epicureans were so disliked by other Greeks uh, that they would go off and found small settlements on their own uh, and live and pursue their brand of philosophy. The last school of thought that we'll discuss is a school of thought known as the Stoics. Uh, and this is an image of the founder of the Stoics. In some ways, the Stoics are similar to things we've discussed in other philosophical schools. They too, for instance, taught that the world was made up of matter, and uh, we could only understand it through careful observation and use of our reason. What is um, interesting and perhaps distinctive about the Stoics is that they really felt that the world as a whole was moving, evolving toward a state of ultimate goodness. Uh, so this is a very optimistic way to look at reality. Human beings were an integral part of this evolution. They were, they were not separate. And in, in fact, it was actually the responsibility of human beings uh, to help uh, create this uh, sense of ultimate goodness, uh, which would be the end of the universe. With that being said, uh, the Stoic did not expect uh, life to be happy throughout. And uh, in fact, the Stoics taught that you could not really control your own fate. You could try your best to do your responsibility, and that was it. The only real response was, uh, in the face of pain, in the, pa in the face of pleasure, to accept everything with indifference. Um, uh, uh, really, it was the divine will what happened to us, uh, and uh, there was no other rational response. The only thing you could control fully was to pursue virtue, to live a life of virtue. And uh, that was one's true nature as a human being. Because of um, this philosophy, Stoics were really thoughtful about what their role in society was. And many argued uh, that you should actually take positions of political power uh, to be able to carry out that responsibility, uh, that uh, you, your responsibility was not just yourself. Unlike, unlike Epicureans, for instance, then, Stoics really didn't have the luxury to be able to retreat uh, away from the world. They felt you had to live within it. It was this uh, sort of ideal of public responsibility uh, that meant that not only was, uh, the, were the Stoics important 
uh, in the political world for the Greeks, uh, but often Romans too uh, would end up embracing this school of philosophy. Uh, so just for one famous example, uh, this is Marcus Aurelius, who was a, a Roman emperor, uh, who also was someone who was heavily invested in the school of Stoicism. Well, that is the lecture. Um, please remember that uh, there's one other lecture, The Empires of Persia, that I want you to, uh, uh, to listen to on Wednesday. Thank you. Bye-bye.